We've talked about a lot of different parts of evolution, and especially all of the small parts that help us understand what's going on. But now we're going to talk about the big stuff, macroevolution. Now that we're at macroevolution, we get to talk about a lot of really cool things, like this guy right here. This is one of my very favorite fossils. This is Anomalocaris, one of the big predators from the Cambrian explosion. We think this was one of the very first predators, and they were probably fairly successful in their day. Um, to understand macroevolution, there's a couple things we're going to talk about. First, we'll talk about what it is always a good place to start. Then we'll talk about fossils, since these are one of our primary sources of information. This will also help us understand how we know all of the information we just talked about in our A Brief History of Life lecture. Next, we'll talk about how we understand the tempo and mode of evolution, how that all happened. Then we'll talk about speciation, how new species form. And we'll talk about species concepts and how everyone likes to argue over how we should actually define this very important concept. And lastly, we'll talk a little bit about systematics and how we organize all the different species and name them. But first, we're going to start with what even is macroevolution in the first place? This is another one of my favorite fossils. This is Archaeopteryx. This is one of the important fossils that helped us discover that birds are descended from dinosaurs and that some dinosaurs had feathers. Um, but let's think about what we know, because um, this will help us con um, organize all of the different concepts we've been learning and help to relate them to each other, because it's always important to connect the different concepts you know rather than keeping them separate in your mind. So we've talked about the forces of evolution. We've also talked about the importance of variation, and we've also talked about heritability, how traits are passed from parent to offspring, and how we can see that common thread of descent with modification. Now what we're going to talk about is the difference between microevolution and macroevolution. We've talked explicitly about microevolution before, and now we're going to talk very explicitly about macroevolution. As you can see with the root words here, micro just means small. So in this case, it just means short term. We're talking about one or a few generations. And macroevolution is big. So this is long term evolution. Now we're looking at evolution over a long period of time. Everything we just talked about in the brief history of life falls under macroevolution. So when we're talking about microevolution, again, we're talking about only a few generations. Um, and it's very small changes. Um, but in many cases, we can actually observe these types of changes in an experiment. And there have been many different experiments that show microevolution over the years. Macroevolution is a little bit different, though, because now we're talking about hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of generations. It's a really long time. And now these changes are much, much bigger. So we're talking about the origin and extinction of species rather than just how a species changes over time. Um, and unfortunately, because we're talking about such a long stretch of time, these are not experimentally observable. We can only get this information through inference and comparison. So our data here is a little bit more indirect, so it is a little less easy to understand. So that's why we always start with understanding microevolution first, because it's a little bit more simple. Let's remind ourselves what that microevolution is, though. This is one of the classic experiments by Peter and Rosemary Grant. Remember, they went back to the Galapagos and looked at these really cute medium ground finches. And they observed after a drought, there was a shift in the average beak depth in their population. The Before the drought, it's our bluebell curve here. There was at first just a lot more individuals, and their, the beak depth was a little bit smaller. After this drought, well, you can see most of them died off, so there's just a much smaller population here, but the average beak depth had shifted to be a little bit higher, so they have bigger and stronger beaks here. And this is because they needed to have those stronger beaks to be able to crack open the harder nuts and seeds that were left to be able to survive at all. Um, and you can see here, it, natural selection like this does tend to be a negative force. It is removing the individuals who are not able to survive um, based on whatever conditions we're talking about. But this is microevolution, remember. This is a difference of two years, and that's not that big a difference <laughs> in the average beak depth. It is a clear increase, but it's not that much. And if the environment returned to what it was um, before the drought, 
the population might go back to this level here. And it's only if we see shifts like this consistently will we actually see a marked change um, in our population. Macroevolution is very different. We have different types of data. Um, first, now we're looking at patterns and trends. So you might look at all the species that exist today and you try and figure out how they're related to each other like this phylogenetic tree here. And then once you figure out how things are related, you can overlay that with how we think evolution happened. And we can look at those trends. Like when we're looking at primates, we see this trend of overall larger brains. So there was something that was driving the evolution of intelligence specifically within primates. Um, spoiler alert, we think that has to do with social relationships and um, you need a larger brain to keep track of all those important and complex social relationships, which now we put towards social media. Another thing we might look at is biogeography and how different species are arranged geographically and how we can connect the evolution of species to different geological changes. Um, lastly, our main source of evidence here are fossils, because this allows us to actually look back in time and figure out, oh, what did life look like 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, 5 million years ago? Um, when we're looking at species that exist today, all we can do is hypothesize what we thought the past looked like, and fossils allow us to actually check and see if we were right. And frequently when we add fossil evidence to the mix, we, are, uh, we get things that we never knew happen because a lot of the fossils that we find left no living descendants. So of course there's no way we could hypothesize their existence. Um, but let's remind ourselves about Wallace's line and the importance of biogeography. So Alfred Russell Wallace, he was a co-discoverer of um, natural selection Though we don't talk about him as much as Darwin because he's the father of biogeography. And he noticed you could draw this line on a map and everything closer to the mainland had animals that looked one way and everything on the other side closer to Australia had very different animals. Basically, Australia has weird stuff living there because they have been isolated from the rest of the mainland for so long. So that's why all of their animals, primarily marsupials, look so different from everything else. Um, but of course, we cannot forget my favorite tarsiers, because if we look at where tarsiers live and overlay Wallace's line, we actually see something unusual. Tarsiers live on both sides of Wallace's line, which isn't supposed to happen based on this hypothesis. Um, with these guys, we do think it is relatively recent island dispersal, um, which makes that one of just one of the many reasons tarsiers are interesting to study. So what is macroevolution and how is it different from microevolution?